Hello and welcome everybody to According to Andrew number 56, The Anatomy of the State, What the State is Not. So, uh, Murray Rothbard has this book called The Anatomy of the State um, that I think mischaracterizes what the state actually is. Uh, really, like, does a really poor job of it, uh, in my opinion. Um, and so I kind of wanted to go through and analyze that and kind of give my, my critiques, my uh, perspective on uh, why this isn't correct and all that stuff. And it will get in a little bit of libertarian philosophy and, and things of that nature. Um, the main things that I go off of to base uh, where I'm getting my perspective from is uh, The Rise and Decline of the State by uh, Martin Van Creveld, uh, which was actually written after this book. This book was written in the 70s, I believe, um, and Martin Van Creveld was written in the 90s. But two books that were definitely around, and I think uh, he should have probably read, are uh, The Prince by Machiavelli and The Discourses by Machiavelli. And both those also um, have plenty of insights into the things that he's talking about that, uh, that I think he just ignores or glances over and things like that and I, I just um really bugs me so the plan was to go through the entire book um and i got through about the first chapter and i had about five pages worth of notes so um i figured that was going to take way too long to a get done for today and b um the video was going to take forever if i had like 60 pages worth of notes that i was going to read to you so um instead I am going to do this kind of chapter by chapter, and so I'm going to name each of these the actual chapters um, of them. So the first one is what the state is not. Um, and so I'll touch on basically the first chapter, but I'll also get into the second and third chapter a little bit. Um, so with that, let's get into it. Uh, so Anatomy of the State. Uh, the book starts uh, with a shallow strongman argument about what the state is not. Uh, it also conflates the state with the government. Uh, the state is an institution of the government, uh, while its range and reach can seem all-encompassing at times that does not uh, make the two one and the same. The state is a form of governance that is, that is derived out of the absolute monarchs of Europe. After growing to such a size, the territory became too big to manage as a single person or even a small retinue. Typically, delegation was reserved uh, for the lords and nobles throughout the land. However, these subjects were untrustworthy at best and treacherous at worst, always trying to take back uh, the power that they had uh, been concentrated with the king. This gave rise to a bureaucracy that managed the affairs of the government to run more efficiently uh, as the bureaucrats were directly loyal to the crown. This idea of being loyal to the crown over uh, time morphed into an abstraction. Now, being Loyal to the crown no longer meant being loyal to the one wearing it, but loyalty to the country as a whole and its institutions. This highly, uh, uh, this high-mindedness is actually caught up in a power struggle where the bureaucrats are trying to wrestle more control for themselves along with the nobility adapting uh, to remain relevant. Uh, basically, the nobility uses an excuse to get into various seats of power and become bureaucrats themselves. Uh, there was... But this created a skeletal structure uh, through the system of from laws and regulations uh, that wasn't reliant on one uh, particular individual to make it work, but the body as a whole. This made the government more stable and less susceptible to shocks like the sudden death of a king. Those events would create setbacks, but the institutions uh, made sure that things kept running while succession was figured out uh, instead of sending the whole country into anarchy while the nobles fought for power. Despite libertarians musing that this uh, was good for the, uh, despite libertarian musings, this change was good for the average person. Because if you were a farmer in the countryside, just uh, worried about having a, having it be peaceful enough existence to raise and feed your family, then an unstable system that leads to civil war every time the king dies sounds uh, that doesn't lead to civil war every single time the king dies sounds good to you, uh, because now you don't have to worry about. Uh, your farm being raided and absolutely destroyed in the middle of a conflict. Uh, and having all of your food stolen and your family killed or starving to death because of the ravishings of war. Uh, so while states would still fight each other, the ramifications of, uh, the ramifications of that created issues. Uh, the conflicts within one's borders was reduced dramatically and for mo the most part, that was a bigger concern uh, than the foreign army coming through. So now we, that we have a system, ah, now that we know what the state's actual origins are, let's examine what uh, Rothbard says 
about it. The first signs of misunderstanding of the entire thing show up in chapter 2. Uh, and it is a misunderstanding that is ubiquitous with libertarian thought. Uh, man is born, he says that man is born naked into this world and needing to use his mind to learn how to take resources given to him by nature and to transform them into shapes. This smacks of the individualism mindset of libertarians and has shown how they fundamentally miss the idea of government because government is not an individualist institution. Uh, because, uh, because in reality, we are not born naked into this world. We are born into this world naked into a family. <clears throat> and that is a very important distinction that I think he misses. Obviously, that is something that Rothbard, like, Rothbard was born into a family. I'm sure he understands that family exists. But the the idea of this rugged individualism that uh, libertarians have is <clears throat> uh, generally writes off the idea of family. Uh, so, so we didn't just appear naked in the middle of a jungle left to fend for ourselves. <clears throat> in fact, the first many years of one's life is spent in complete dependence of your mother and father. This is, uh, there's no taking resources and making stuff until two or three at the earliest. Even then, you wouldn't be able to survive without the more advanced skill sets of your parents making up for your productive shortfalls, which will come into play later. Some may argue that I am strongmining this statement. But libertarians and individualism go hand in hand, <clears throat> and that uh, isn't a mischaracterization of their philosophy or their way of thinking. <clears throat> Being that the base unit of society is the family and not the individual, as Rathbard believes, then the characterizations he makes about the state need to be looked at in this new light. The most obvious one comes in chapter 1, when he is discussing an idea of we are the government from the individualist perspective. This sounds absurd, but from the family perspective, it doesn't. Rothbard states, If the government has incurred a huge public debt, which must be paid by taxing one group for the benefit of another, uh, this reality of burden is obscured by saying we own, owe it to ourselves. Uh, but this belies the simple fact that this is how group dynamics always work. Just look back at the family example that I had previously. Uh, there's the child is a burden and a basically a public debt to the family. Are they going to get rid of that person or say this person has to work uh, harder or something like that? No, because it's a child. <clears throat> Likewise, there's always going to be trade-offs and and restrictions to the to the ambitions and wants of the individual when you're working within the a group dynamic. Uh, So, as I said, uh, going back to the example of the family, is the child not a burden to his parents? Of course they are. But they, <clears throat> but not everything is an economic transaction, and th sometimes the costs are borne by one individual or subsector of a group for the betterment of the whole group. No one individual is going to be able to act solely as an individual and be part of a group. The ambitions, whims, and desires of that individual will have to be tamed uh, so the group can function. In addition, we are the government is not an oxymoron moronic statement to use uh he to use the conscription of the example that rothbard cites uh what would happen if basically he says uh are people uh simply conscripted and that is the the will of them or whatever like is it really their will to be conscripted into uh the army and in reality in in a sense it is because at the end of the day what would happen if everyone who was conscripted conscripted simply refuse to be conscripted. Would this supposedly all-powerful government have the power to do anything? Of course not, because while the people don't exercise their will too often, the consent of the government is absolutely in play. The reason it doesn't usually come into play is because getting that many people on the same page is hard. It is the kind of like the prisoner's dilemma, uh, which basically <clears throat> is, uh, you have two people, the prisoner, uh, well, okay, I'll get back to the prisoner's dilemma, uh, is like the prisoner's dilemma and another thing that Machiavelli cites, which is basically uh, while a mass of people can be very uh, dangerous and a political force, that is also more points of failure within the uh, group and therefore uh, can be picked apart if uh, done wisely. The prisoner's dilemma is the dilemma of you have two people who are in 
uh, going to go to prison, potentially. And if neither of them talks, they both walk. Uh, but if one of them talks, they get five years in prison, and the, the other person gets 20, 20 years in prison. And if the other person talks, they get five years in prison, and their, their co-conspirator gets 20 years. So there's constant... And if they both talk, they both get, like, 30 years in prison or something like that. So uh, it behooves them to both but not talk, but it's also uh, more beneficial for each individual to talk uh, and only get five years. But then if they both do talk, then they, they both get like the max sentencing and, uh, and it ends up screwing them both over to uh, even more extreme. So um, that's, that's the prisoner's dilemma. And that is the dynamic that's constantly working in this uh, environment with uh, with everybody that's going on. Uh, Rothbard even acknowledges this fact in the uh, of this power, even acknowledges the fact of this power of the masses nine pages later in chapter three. So it is unclear why he would start the book with such a disingenuous argument. Uh, he then goes and ends chapter one by uh, stating that the state has a monopoly on violence. Uh, it then uses that violence to coerce money out of people. This is true, and one of the founding uh, purviews of the state as an institution as established during the Peace of Westphalia that ended the Thirty Years' War. Before this period of time, there were many non-state and non-government actors that could and did use violence throughout this period. This primary, primarily, uh, The primary one during the Thirty Years' War would have been religious groups, but there was also mercenary groups and uh, roving bags, bands of brigadiers and things like that. Uh, and obviously some of these groups like missionary groups can change from being mercenary groups to brigadiers. And they, uh, you know, a lot of times were hired by governments, but not always. Well, there are always limits to policing. Um, it was still a market improvement, uh, getting rid of all of these random bands that could come and destroy your livelihood and your, or your life, um, and allow simply a one concentrated, uh, force to be able to, to do that. On top of that, just because the government says that they have something doesn't mean that it does. Modern states are finding more competition when it comes to their authority in the form of non-state actors. Does anyone think the Mexican government has a monopoly on violence or that that monopoly uh, slowly uh, monopoly on violence? Or is that monopoly slowly being shifted to the cartels who are more and more being seen as legitimate rulers of Mexico? This is one example that highlights how government's declarations do nothing if they cannot enforce uh if they cannot be enforced, and if the government no longer is responsive to the people, then it will lose its legitimacy and power. And we see this over and over again and stuff like that. And it's something that they simply don't acknowledge as um, uh, as libertarians. So uh, that's kind of a introductory uh, to what we're going to be going through. Um, and some of the issues that, that prop up. We'll be going through uh, this more as we go through. Uh, next week, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the stuff where they talk about um, taxes and, and how that works. Uh, and one of the reasons, one of the things I find funny about this, this will be kind of a primer to what we'll probably dig into deeper next week, is this idea that uh, taxes are not allowed, but rent is okay. But if you look at the origins of most of the states, especially like feudalism and stuff like that, they basically originate from... Uh, taxes basically originate as rent and but like with some other caveats where they're like you can't be kicked off the land but then they can also force you to pay basically and that's kind of like the compromise they come to so it's like well is, would that be okay seen as okay in a libertarian society well now we have a government again uh yeah sure it's feudalism and maybe you prefer feudalism to uh to our current uh government and how we run stuff via the state but the matter of the fact is uh Government's always going to exist. So, uh, that's the first kind of, uh, ch first chapter for sure, and uh, first couple of things looked into on the anatomy of state, and hopefully that kind of highlights some of the issues uh, with it, and we'll get into more and more of that. Uh, if you guys are interested in kind of what uh, what comp uh, makes up the state, what what is the state, what all the, the things that go into it, um, hopefully these next series of podcasts will uh, help you understand that. Uh, but if you guys are looking for some reading material, I can't recommend uh, more The Rise and Decline of the State by Martin Van Creveld. It's a fantastic book on the whole thing, and especially uh, the middle section, I think it's section two, that goes through uh, how the these governments were able to concentrate power over that time period is very informative. Um, 
where uh, they have the, the rise of the state, section two, uh, that he goes through, and uh, the state is an instrument, uh, are very, very useful, and then the state is an ideal, um, also has some interesting aspects into it. Uh, <clears throat> so I, uh, I do recommend that book, and then also you have Machiavelli's works of The Prince and The Discourses that also kind of highlight some of this stuff. But if you're talking about strictly seeing the state as an institution and how it, it develops, uh, I can't recommend uh, Rise and Decline of the State uh, more. So anyway, uh, hopefully this has been informative and uh, you guys find it interesting. Do your regular thing, like, comment, subscribe. Um, we're on YouTube and BitChute and Odyssey and Podbean. Um, if there's a place you would like me to be that I'm not, let me know, and I will try to uh, make it one of the places I regularly upload to. Uh, anyway, thank you guys all for listening, and hope you guys have a good day. Goodbye.